and you tried to do it directly, what would happen? What would you assume directly? I'm assuming five angles for this two. Assume it's odd, yeah. and so that would mean it's equal to two k plus one for some integer k, which means. You try to solve for n, right? So n would be 2k, you subtract 3, so that's going to be minus 2, and then you divide by 5. Right? Now that's kind of sketchy to deal with, right? How do you know that that will fit your definition? Because you have sort of a two-fifth here. How can you guarantee that your k is going to be such that um, that guy would simplify to be 2 times something? Because 2 times an integer in fact. So we can actually factor our 2 here. We get k minus 1 over 5. But is this an integer? It's kind of hard to tell. You need some other explanation for why that might be an integer. So jumping in directly here kind of brings you into a shaky spot. Um, dealing with this guy being odd is kind of complicated, at, at least at this point. However, so that's dealing with the P, right? So this is this guy, that's your P. This guy is your Q. Now if you look at the Q, that's just a single variable being odd or even that we have to deal with, that's actually going to be a lot easier in this case to start off with. So because this is more complicated than that, this is much easier to deal with in terms of my definitions, I probably want to start messing with this statement first. However, I can't just throw that statement in because I need to make sure that whatever we're doing is logical and it's, followed, it, it's verified by a truth table that I can prove it. So instead of assuming that, I can assume not that, which is pretty much just as easy, easy to deal with. So here, a proof by counter positive would be nicer. So, proof. Assume that 5n plus, uh, assume that n is odd. Now, immediately when you write that first step, I would know you're doing a proof by counter positive because it's clear that you're assuming not Q, right? So you writing that first sentence should kind of announce what method you're thinking of using. So that's automatically showing that this is not, you're assuming not Q, not Q, okay? So now if N is odd, what does that mean? N equals to K plus one for some K. Two K plus one for some K Z. Well, that would mean we get to the Yeah. Could we, would it be better to just like state, assume that n is odd, instead of just writing, assume n equals 2k plus 1, where k is an integer? Come again? So, like, can we just like leave out the first line if we wanted to, and just write, assume n, n equals 2k plus 1? Yeah. And then, okay. Yeah. I'd rather you write it, but I wouldn't punish you for not writing that first line. Um, then, yeah, so now, now what do we do? So if we assume that n is 2k plus 1. Find the negation 3. Show that uh, 5 minus 3 is even, if you want to prove that. Right, right. so, so we know, in your mind, you should know what you need to prove, need to show that 5n plus 3 is even, right? That's ultimately where you want to get to. Now, and that's based on what you know you want to prove. And so you know that your ending statement needs to be about this expression 5n plus 3. So let's start looking at that. What does this say about 5n plus 3? Well, if n is this, let's take that and plug it in here. And so now we can start to simplify that. So that's 10k plus 8 which I can now factor out of 2. And this is clearly an integer based on the assumptions that we had before. Because k is an integer multiplied by 5, it's an integer added to an integer, it's an integer. That's clear. There are no rational, there are no fractions or anything like that that might make things hairy. That's clearly an integer, and it's clearly even. So as time goes on, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to 
recognize when one, one proof technique will be nicer than the other. But at this stage, if you happen to just start a direct proof before, you should realize that you'll get to some point where it's like, ah, this is not going to work out. And then you can go back and scrap it. But, but ultimately, you should be able to look at each statement, and you want to start with basically the easiest one to deal with. Which is, if you've been proving things like trig identities from in, in pre-calculus, it's literally the opposite of what you want to do. So you're doing your like, proven identities, you want to start with a more complicated expression. But here you start with the easiest one. Two times two k squared plus two k plus one. 
This is an integer. This means n squared is odd. And so now I prove that direction. I write this little thing here to show that I'm going the other direction. Or you might, if you like writing, you can write out a sentence for the converse. And then you continue the sentence. But I'm indicating what direction I'm proving to the reader to help him read the proof. And so now we want to prove this one. But I also do contrapositive. No, because contrapositive would have me dealing with this guy, which is the radical. <coughs> you don't want to deal with that. The first statement, the P, is easier to deal with, so I'll actually do a direct proof here. Um, assume n is even, <coughs> then n equals 2k for some integer k, which means that n squared is going to be 4k squared, which is equal to 2 times 2k squared. That's an integer which is even. Now I can improve. So notice you have to remember when there's an if and only if it's a biconditional, you have to prove two directions. Each direction might require a different proof technique that should not be surprising to you. And later on, we'll learn even more proof techniques. At any given time, a single problem might require you to use a multitude of techniques. There's no one size fits all anything. Okay, so prove one direction. Um, this, it was used, it was nice to work with this, so I use the contrapositive. In the other direction, it was nice to work with the first one, so I use the direct proof. So it's a proof by contrapositive, direct, direct proof there to prove the entire statement. Indicate what direction you're proving somehow to the reader. Questions? Assume n is odd. Then n equals 2k plus 1 for k an integer. This means that 3n plus 1 must be equal to 3 times 2k plus 1 plus 1. This would mean that at 6k plus 4, this would be 2 times 3k plus 2, and that's an integer which is even. That's the negation of what the original statement says, but the statement said it was odd, and that is a proof. Not so bad. Okay. But then the integer?
prove that 3n plus 1 is odd implies
Okay, but let's pretend you didn't do that, <laughs> right? And you just ended up with this. You would still choose n is even here based on your intuition because you would look at the possible cases, right? Like if n were odd, this would end up giving you an even number. And if n were e like, you know because this is an odd time, you have to remember those rules that we had from before that odd times odd is odd, and even times odd, blah, 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 blah. And so basically you'll kind of know for this to be odd, your n would have to be even, right? Because if your n were odd, then this would be an odd times an odd, which is an odd, added to an odd would make it even, right? However, if this were even, even times odd is even, then you add an odd, you get an odd, right? So the, the fact that this is odd, it makes sense for you to kind of assume that you would get n is even. So, I particularly wanted to I prove this over here because I wanted you to, oh, didn't we just show that? But it's fine if you didn't see that. Um, there's still a lot of intuition that based on all these other facts that you know, you can kind of make a guess, right? And so this kind of will happen in practice. I mean, sometimes you have a complicated statement to prove and you literally don't know where to go and you know that you want to use some sort of intermediary step, but you don't exactly know what that is. Sometimes you just hazard a guess. Some of that seems to make sense based on all the things you've known before, and you just go for it. You try to prove it. And at some point, if there's a hiccup, you're like, no, no, probably I assume the wrong thing. And then you, I mean, math research can be a very tedious and repetitive and um, recursive process. And it can take years, but this is not going to take us years. It's kind of clear here, based on the few facts that we know, it's it, it, assuming n is even would make sense. So what I would do is I would use this as a lemma. So I will very suggestively rename this example as lemma one. And to indicate that I'm going to be using this one. And so now we can say, do a direct proof, assume 3n plus 1 is odd. Then, by lemma 1, we know n is even. So this statement here is using a lemma in the middle of a proof to get to some sort of intermediate step, which is a better launching point for another part of the proof. So this is the use of the lemma. using a smaller proof to help you prove a larger proof. And you can kind of see when you might want to use such a thing is when both statements are pretty complicated that starting at either one is kind of sketchy. So you kind of want to use one to get to somewhere else that's easier for you to launch from. And so that's when you use a lemma. Um, so in, the, in a proof by cases, you still wouldn't be in that situation where you would think, oh, these are both too complicated. In a proof by cases, you really do understand one of the statements enough in order to break it into cases. Right? You'll know enough about it. You won't have this state of confusion like where do I go. So it's very rare that you actually do a proof by cases in this kind of scenario. So we probably use a lemma. Right? So I do a direct proof here. And I'm using the lemma that was proven before. I know that if 3n plus 1 is odd, it has to mean that n is even. And so then I can say if n is even, then n is equal to 2k for some integer k. Then, now what are I going to do? Plug in to 5 Right. I want to make a statement about 5n plus 2. I want to make the statement that this is actually even. So I'm going to start looking at what does that expression tell me now. So this is 5 times, now I'm going to plug in that 2k. This is going to be 2 times 5k plus 1. And that's an integer. Which is even. Uh, can we add 2n 
n plus one on both sides after setting up the three n plus one. Two n plus one to both sides of what? So say that I know that three n plus one is odd, so then three n plus one is equal to two k plus one plus some k. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just going to manipulate that to get to five n plus two. You could do that. You can't always do that, but in this case, yes, because it works out very nicely, right? Um, and there are times when we're going to do this. I, I, these such manipulations are really convenient when we are in the section about um, what we're talking about equivalence relations. So I'll show you some examples of that. But here I really wanted to show you guys the things dilemma. Um, but say you wanted to assume. 3n plus 1 is odd. So we're still doing a direct proof, but we're going to do a different manipulation, not using the lemma. More than one ways to skin a cut. Then 3n plus 1 equals 2k plus 1 for integer k. This means so what did you say you want to do? So you realize that you can get to 5n plus 2. So to 3n, just add 2n. And to the 1, just add a 1 to get to the 2. So you can realize that this is 3n plus 1. And what you're going to do is you're going to add expression to both sides, which is valid when we're solving the equations. So add 2n plus 1 and add a 2n plus 1. So you can do that by adding it to both sides. Turns out that this side simplifies to 5n plus 2, which is exactly the expression that you want to talk about. And this side becomes 2k plus 2n plus 2, which is 2 times k plus n plus 1. And that's an integer, which is Yeah, that is also valid. Because this step is a valid thing, because there's one of the axioms of the real numbers that says we can add the same thing to both sides. Anyway. So for now, we'll assume that all the rules of algebra that you know about work. Um, but when we get to the other textbook, we'll actually talk about um, the axioms that these guys come from and how we have to prove certain things that would have been obvious before. But yeah, that is also a valid way to do it. So you can use a mini proof in the middle of it to help you out if both problems are complicated. Or if you can see there's some way to construct the other statement using the previous statement in a convenient way, then you can also do that. And that's the technique. We'll use that technique a lot, but mostly in like chapter 8. I think it's chapter 8. Ask a question. Is it true that if 5n plus 2 is true, <coughs> then 3n plus 1 is odd? Is the converse of the statement true? Yes. What do you mean shouldn't be? Because the the conference in the statement is equivalent to the truth table. No. Contrapositive. Oh, the contrapositive. Contrapositive is equivalent. I'm writing down the converse here. So if this were P implies Q, this is the same as Q implies P. Is that actually true here? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, prove it, right? So that's actually, let's see, proof. Assume 5n plus 2 is even, then let's just use the shorter way, I think. 5n plus 2 equals 2k, um, or k in z. This means that 3n plus 1 would be equal to 2k. I'm going to subtract 2 and subtract 1. This would mean that 3n plus 1 is equal to, what I'm going to do here is this minus 1, 
I'm going to write as minus 2 plus 1 just to make it fit my definitions better. So this is going to be 2, factor out of 2 from all of these, that would leave me with a minus n minus 1 plus 1. This is an integer, which is odd. i.e., what can I say about these two statements? Hmm? By conditional, by conditional, give me another nice phrase. Yeah, equivalent. We can say they're equivalent. Right, so this is that to say that 5n plus 3, 5n plus 2, is even if and only if 3n plus 1 is odd, i.e. Saying that 5n plus 2 is even is equivalent to saying that 3n plus 1 is odd. So now I just want to introduce a another kind of statement that you can encounter in mathematics. Um, for those of you who have taken linear algebra before, you have seen this already, this kind of statement. Maybe even before then. It's the, these kinds of statements are called the following or equivalent. So, um, so this is just, this is an abbreviation for the following. <coughs> Essentially, you have to prove, do what I 
what we essentially kind of did here to prove. So if I give you a statement like this, the following are equivalent statement. you must establish literally a chain of implications. Starting and ending at the same statement. Example. Let's say P, Q, R are equivalent to prove this, what you would actually do is to actually prove a chain of implications. So you show that P implies Q, show that Q implies R, and then show that R goes back to P. Right? You have to go through all the statements with an implication linking them in a chain, you have to start and end at the same point. And it doesn't really matter where you choose to start and end, start wherever it's easiest for you, so you can start at Q, and then you can prove P, use that to prove R, and then use R to go back to Q. It's important that you cycle through all the statements and start and end at the same place. And what you realize is that you've actually created a by implication between any two of these letters that you pick, right? So if you pick, talk about Q and P, for instance, Clearly Q implies P via the lemma R, but also P implies Q via this implication, right? You will have, always have the biconditionals going in both directions once you can prove such a chain. So if you have this kind of statement, very important kind of statement in mathematics, but if you ever have to prove one of them, this is sort of how you would go about it. <coughs> Start at some point, go through a bunch of implications, and come back to that same point. And by doing that, you're proving all the different arrangements of by implications all at once. And these statements are very, very useful. So I can say something like, um, example, if 3n plus 1 is odd, then n is even. So if a student writes something like this, they go, That is you assuming the thing that you have to prove. 
right? This is not a valid way to start a proof, right? If you have P implies Q, you can assume P, you can assume not Q, you can assume other things that we'll talk about, but you can never assume Q is true. It is not logical to start there. That is called begging the questions. Assuming what you have to prove, then clearly, whatever you do in this, these ellipses, it's going to end up where you wanted it to end up because you kind of assumed that had to be the case in the first place. You've never actually proven anything. Um, so that is a very big no-no. There was another one that I wanted to I think we'll get back to it. It's because I, I saw someone write something I was like, oh, you shouldn't do that. I, I didn't write it down in my notes to mention. But this is a big one that I'll always remember to mention. Um, um, write this down as well, uh, probably in all caps. start a proof by, assume, by begging the question, I will ignore everything else you write, because it won't matter. I'll just give you a zero in the morning. Right. Now, I don't want you to confuse this with a trivial proof, which we mentioned before, that says P implies Q is automatically true if you realize that Q is true. That's not you assuming Q is true. You have evidence to realize that Q is a tautology. That's a different thing. That's not you just assuming it's true, pretending it's true. Let's just say it's true. It's very different from knowing, hey, this is a tautology. It is actually true. I can prove that this is always true in all cases. That's very different from just, hey, let's pretend it's true. When you assume something, you're pretending. Right? Let's pretend this is true. Let's assume this is true. That is, that is a big, big no no. It's a very bad thing to do. It's called begging the question, it has a name, it's a logical fallacy. Um, the other one should come to me soon, because I'm, I'm sure someone's going to do it again. It happens, you know, you're learning, it's normal. So, that actually ends chapter 3, so a little more for that. Is <coughs> Are there any questions before we move on? Which is essentially more of the same. It's still about direct proofs and proofs by contradiction, but we're going to learn some new concepts in which we want to apply. So we're going to prove things about um, some more number theoretical stuff, mostly about invisibility, and we're also going to talk about proving things with real numbers. Here we've been working with integers mostly, but we want to start talking about real numbers as well, as well as proving things that have to do with sets of things, so sets. Um, so we're going to apply our knowledge within that context. So I believe the title of the chapter is more on direct proof and proof by control. And that is chapter four. So more of the same, but we're going to change the context in which we're working. Um, here's a little bit of background that we'll need here. And this is a very important thing. If you go into abstract algebra, you'll probably hear this mentioned in the first week. Um, but depending on the class, some of us might skip it all together, but it's a very important thing. It's called the division algorithm. Actually, talk about it. 
So this says the following that A, B, B integers. Then there exists unique integers Q and R. Which by the way, the, the, the what they call the letters are very suggestive. Q you can actually think of as quotient. And R you can think of as remainder. Then, in terms 
of divisibility by another integer In fact, let me name the other integer. In terms of divisibility by another integer, let's call it n, we can express a uniquely in a finite number of ways. In fact, we can express it in n ways. So, for example, minus 1, you know it's odd. 
kind of reconciling with other things it gives you extra work when there doesn't have to be. Uh, yeah. I actually one class earlier, I remember in an earlier class we had three consecutive values that we used to prove something where we had like uh, n minus one, n plus yeah. one, mm -hmm. which would be kind of the same where for like n equals three you could say it like that, but it wouldn't really make sense to. You could, in fact. So when we had that scenario where we were like uh, n times I think it was n minus 1 times n times n plus 1, right? n minus 1 times n times n plus 1, right? Now, in terms of, say, divisible by 3, it turns out that such an expression, we're guaranteed to be able to divide it by 3, because there are only 3 cases. I can replace n with 3k plus 3k, n with 3k plus 1, or n with 3k plus 2, right? And in this case, this guy's divisible by 3, so the whole thing is divisible by 3. In this case, this guy's divisible by 3, so the whole thing is divisible by 3. In this case, this guy's divisible by 3, so the whole thing is divisible by 3. And that's why, in fact, I know that every consecutive integer will always be even, because one of them have to be even, because the only two possibilities for n is n can be written as 2k, or n can be written as 2k plus 1. If n is 2k, that's even. If n is 2k plus 1, that's even. And again, it's a consequence of the division algorithm. So any consecutive list of n integers will be divisible by the number n as a consequence of the division algorithm. And so that's something you can state without proof at this point. Do you know who created that? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't remember. It's, it's very old. It's a, it's a very ancient theory. If that's the guy like, uh, responsible for the long division from like, the child. <laughs> so let's, I wouldn't be surprised, but I, I honestly don't remember who came up with it. But this is a very important idea, and it, it allows you to break things into several cases, especially if divisibility is a concern. You always know a certain amount of cases. And this is used a lot, especially with those, you know, people who are obsessed with prime numbers. They can talk about, oh, every prime number has to be in this form, you know? So there's a divisible by four, where it's like, if, if n is prime, then there are only two possibilities for what it looks like. It has to be this guy or that guy, right? Because if it's this guy, it's even, and if it's that guy, it's even means it's divisible by 2. So you can even use that as, as a way to cut down on cases. So if you're telling a supercomputer to try to find primes, you can program it to ignore things that all these integers and only look at those integers and things like that. It can help you out in, in many ways. So it's a very important theory. It's, it's used all over in the number theory. Um, and a lot of the intuition that we have, like the list of two numbers has to be more product of two consecutive integers has to be even, a lot of it actually comes from this idea. But, you know, you can't tell kids in preschool about the division algorithm. You just have to tell them, it's consecutive, right? And odd and even switch each other, right? They alternate forever. You know, yes. Yeah, so, wait, wait, wait. Who's divided in preschool? Huh? Who's divided in preschool? Yeah, that was a lot for That was a stretch. Is it? <laughs> I came here for college. I was educated in another country, so I don't know how you guys are. I mean, maybe with like beads. <laughs> let's divide the beads, man. <laughs> let's divide the beads. Okay, alright, let's get back on track. <coughs> we end at 12 10? Yeah. So, such a weird time. We're going to have to get used to it. Okay, now let's talk about divisibility. We're going to prove things about divisibility and then congruence, which is going to be a nice segue for those of you who are going to take out abstract algebra. Did you have a question? Um, what's the Euclid division algorithm? Are they different? I don't know. But I, I don't think it's the same as the Euclid. So let's go into the divisibility of integers, which is going to help us talk about congruence of integers, which is ultimately going to help us talk about congruence mod n, which in abstract algebra is going to be one of the elementary groups that you study. Groups is a proper name, so that's not just. So, where are we here? So, okay, so it's just the definition first. A, B, and integers. A is not equal to zero. 
we say A divides B. And write A bar B. If A divides B is another way of saying A divides into B and leaves no remainder. So you can think of it as saying that B equals A times K or some integer K. There's no R, the R is zero. Right? And we say that A divides B. I think the book uses C here, but it doesn't matter. Example. If N is even, we can write 2 divides N. N is even means 2 can divide into it and leave no remainder. Right? If A does not divide B, meaning when I divide B by A, I get a remainder left over. We write, no surprise here, a strike through in the simple for divisibility. Right? So that's to say A does not divide B. Right? Which, by the way, the moment you know that, it means that the first guy in this table is taken off and your A can be expressed in N minus 1 ways. So that's a division. Prove that for integers a and a, b, and c, where a is not 0 and b is not 0, that if a divides b and b divides c, then a divides c. In language that we'll talk about later, this is to say that divisibility by non-zero integers are transitive. We'll talk about that language more in chapter 8. So if your A divides into B with no remainder and your B divides into C with no remainder, then ultimately your A will divide into C with no remainder. And would you be able to use the same 
T equals BK, but would the BMT is the same or L? No, we'd have to use something different. There's no, there's no telling whether it's the same multiple, right? That's not an assumption. So we'd have to use this for uh, K L. This would mean what? C equals First of all, where do we want to end up with? That, that's always important, right? The, 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 the end goal is always important. What do you want to be able to say ultimately? A divided you want to be able to say that A divides C. Well, what does that mean? There's no remainder. I mean, there. C can be written in terms of AK. Right, so C equals. A K L O A times some integer, right? Uh, let's call it N, oh, yeah. where N is an integer. So you need to know that this is where you want to end up. Okay, so that that will help you choose what kind of ideas you want to employ, what kind of manipulations you want to do, what kind of substitutions you want to do. At the end of the day, you need to show that C is equal to A times something. So probably starting with C is going to be a good idea. C equals. Can we say anything about C here? Other than it's B times L. You say that it's equal to AKL? Yeah. B is this. So plug that in here. So that means C is equal to A times K times L, which means that C is equal to A times KL. And that guy is an integer. There's no remainder. This means. Um, all right, so you probably want to write this down. I, I said it a few times verbally, but it's something you should really be aware of. Um, know where you want to end up. Right, so if, you, if you're doing, and, and you'll know this by the technique that you chose. If you chose a direct proof, you know you want to end up saying the last part of the statement. But when I say know where you want to end up, I want you to know what mathematical statement would imply saying that statement that you want to end up with. Right? So to be able to say this, I need to be able to say this. And this is just a mathematical equation, it's easy to get to. You know what I mean? Conceptually, it's easy to get. To. Right? So it gives you a goal. So you know that you start somewhere, you want to do a direct proof. You need to know, where should I end up? Where do I know I'm done? The proof is over. I've shown what I need to show. Right? That's all, the end goal is always important. Right? Know where you're, where you're starting. Know where you're supposed to end up. Right? And choosing the proof technique, that will always, um, that will always be clear. The only, one, the only proof technique where that's kind of sketchy is a proof by contradiction, but we'll deal with that. Because in a proof by contradiction, you're not sure where you end up, you just know you want to end up somewhere bad. <laughs> it's, essential. it's essentially going to be the idea. Yeah. yeah, so to, in doing a proof by contradiction, the goal is to get the wrong answer. <laughs> and that will somehow imply the right answer. But yeah, so that's, that wasn't too hard, but I just wanted to, you guys to get used to the idea of working with divisibility. The, the idea here with divisibility is. You can always write it in terms of an equation, and that tells you where you want to start and where you want to end. So let's actually do another example. Right, so let's let A be an integer. Show that 3 divides. 2a implies that 3 divides a. In other words, if 3 can divide into an even integer, it doesn't divide into the 2. It obviously must divide into the other guy. Okay, ideas. Divide into a multiple of A? Okay, yeah. Well, 
So here the goal is which one would be easier to work with, a 2A or an A? And in this case, the case I think is clearly the A, because obviously if you have a 2 divided by 3, you can see that there's going to be a 2 thirds showing up somewhere. It's not going to be a nice thing to deal with. Right? So here, I think dealing with the last statement is the better way to go. And so if I'm going to deal with the last statement, what must I assume? It's false. Assume it's false. Why? Because that's the proof by contraposite. So if you start by, so you might say you realize um, this is the easier one, so you start by assuming 3 divides A. Do that, Javon gives you 0. That's how that would go. That's what you need to assume. You have to do a proof by contraposite. Right? Okay, so if 3 does not divide A, then what can you say? Two cases. Then there are two cases. What are the cases? Uh, a can either be written as 3k plus 1 for some k. Right, a is 3k plus 1 for some k. Or you can use q, it doesn't matter. This one. For case 2, a is equal to 3k plus 2 for some k. Why? Because there are only three possible ways to write down what a is in terms of divisible by 3. One of them is a equals 3k, but that means that the 3 divides a, so that's no longer an option. The other two is this way, therefore we have two cases to deal with, right? So the division algorithm implies that a is one of these forms. By making this assumption, we take this form off the table, so there are only two other forms that we have to contend with. So now, by assuming that, we know we can assume either one of these um, this is a 1, that's a 2, they're different enough, so I wouldn't do it without loss of generality. I'll actually just do a direct proof for each of them. Okay, so in case 1, what would that mean? That would mean that... Can you all plug in 2? Or would you just plug it in? Okay, so remember what we had. What do I, where do I want to end up? Let's think about that. What would I need to show her? Yes. C does not equal 3. So I need to... 3 is not the limit. Where do I want to end up? I want to end up with the fact that 3 does not divide 2a. Which means that your 2a should be 3k plus 1, or your 2a should be... 3k plus 2. So my end goal is to be able to say either this equation or that equation. Okay? Which means I need to start out by saying something about the, the integer 2k, 2a. Right? Now I know about the integer a, so what can I say about the integer 2a? Well, just multiply that by 2. If a equals 3k plus 1, then that would mean that 2a is equal to 2 times 3k plus 1, but that would be equal to 3 times 2k plus 2, which is one of these forms, which means 3 does not divide 2a in case 2. If my a is equal to 3k plus 2, which is the other case, then that would mean my 2a is equal to 2 times 3k plus 2. That's 3 times 2k. Let's make sure I don't make any stupid algorithm mistakes here. Let's just write it out. This is 6k plus 4, which I can write as the 4 I'm going to write as 3 plus 1. And factor out of 3. So that's going to be 3 times 2k plus 1 plus 1. Since it's 3 times an integer plus 1, it's in this form. That means 3 does not divide 2 big. So the moral of the story, if you get stuck somewhere, like you kind of know how you start out, but you don't know where to go, just, just think about, just put, give yourself a goal, right down in a corner somewhere. Here's where I want to end up. I want to be able to say this or this or this or that. And then you just try to see which one of those would be easiest for you to get to. And a lot of times we will hint to you what the next step is. So we know we want to start with this guy because it's the easier one. That means we have to assume this. That means these two 
are what we can assume. These two tell us about A, and I know I want to end up saying something about 2A. So, can I finagle this to say something about 2A? Yes, just multiply both sides by 2. Right? And that tells you, oh, that's my next step, multiply both sides by 2. Right? So knowing where you want to end up can actually tell you, it will suggest to you ideas or manipulations that you might want to do, and you need to just make sure that they're legal and, and logical. Any other questions? Okay, so we'll do two more examples here that I'll tell you two other things you need to know and then we'll move on to another subtopic.
What do I want them to say? If I multiply both sides by 2, I can get 2 times x squared minus 5 equal to 4k. That tells me I have something about 2 times this, not this. Mm -hmm. Like, but it's 
I think it would be the easier one at this point to be able to pull off is to actually do the thing that you didn't want to do in the first place, the contrapositive. <laughs> right? Sometimes you have to just bite the bullet and while initially it might seem easier to do one as opposed to the other, you'll get to a point where mm, I, I can't really justify factoring out a two here. I don't know anything about this k. Right? However, if that were a four, I could factor out the two. Right? And this guy requires me to write something in terms of multiples of two. So in this case, I would actually um, better to buy a bullet and do not follow. Right, this is one of those hard life lessons in a school of hard ones. You just, you know, sometimes you gotta, you gotta just do it. And in terms of, but in terms of the lessons that we need to be aware of, and whenever, whenever I'm teaching like lower level, level classes, this is kind of the, the issue that students get into, um, where they get to a point where they really don't know what they should do next, and they just start randomly doing stuff, even though it's completely the wrong thing. Like they'll cancel across the sum because, oh, I get to cancel the h in the bottom to get the derivative when that was it's totally illegal. But they get to a point and they just panic and they start doing things. You need to know what it is illegal for you to do. So there were a couple times someone mentioned, why don't we just say that this is 4m for something? That's begging the question, right? That is never the option. You can never do that under any circumstances. So you need to be able, you need to be aware of things like this. So when you get to some point and you start freaking out and getting anxious, you don't want to do anything too crazy, right? So you have to always be aware of I can't do this, I can't do this. Do not do that, do not do that. There's no point can I make that assumption. And so that forces you to think about things in another way. You're like, okay, if I can't do that, what can I do? Uh, proof by positive probably, because then I can factor out a two from a four, but I can't factor out a four from a two. A priori, unless I actually know what this guy is. So here you, you just have to do the hard thing and just do a contrapositive. Four does not divide x squared minus five. Then there are three cases now, right? So my x squared minus five is equal to um, four k plus one, or x squared minus five is equal to four k plus two, or three my x squared minus five is equal to 4k plus 3, or Is it that same, no? Or that's okay. Because the last one's about it. The last one would be 4k. Yeah. Okay. And so you take one case at a time. See you guys tomorrow, more freeze due tomorrow.